Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, okay, this is going to be a lively one, so brace yourselves. 20 minutes, we're going to go for it. So, to teach is to learn twice. I'll come back to that. The idea being of this one is really to set up the next two talks, in fact. It's talk, to talk to you about the, our approach to archaeology and training. Um, it's very dear to our heart. Um, it's the core of what we do as a company. Always has been from the get-go. Um, I will just say, what happened with the pandemic was that put the rocket boosters underneath it. And the way we've seen the pandemic is very much that it's a catalyst. It's um, speeded up a lot of the things that were happening. And with the kind of pause that happened after that initial lockdown, when suddenly the world went quiet for a bit, um, we focused massively on training. We saw that that was the opportunity within that sort of space. So what are the challenges? <laughs> we face them every day, both as individuals and in our respective organisations. There's a huge variation in skills in archaeology, huge variation in experience, uh, and also mindsets, people's positivity, negativity, perceptions, and so on. Um, and I must admit, I work across lots of industries because of my particular role at the moment. And I've got to say, archaeology, to me, is pretty badly afflicted by this. You know, um, there is huge variation from people who have stunning approaches, people who do stunning work, to people who are in such a bad place. And that variety is tremendous. And that's a real problem that we've got to face. There's also varying appetites for change and for learning. Uh, and also attitudes to it. Some people welcome it, and some people fear it, and everything in between. Um, another problem that we find is that uh, training tends often to be focused on technical skills. So, you know, it might be go and do a banksman course, learn about GIS. The problem is that it often doesn't also focus on the person. So you get people promoted on the basis of their technical skills, and they don't necessarily have the uh, personal development to go with it. So, that's a big thing that we need to look at. Another one is the pandemic. I've mentioned that, the catalyst. One of the big problems that's faced us is the effect on people's mindsets. Um, some people have coped very well in the pandemic. Some people are loners. Working from home has been fantastic. For other people, it has crushed them. Um, and we need to look at that. How do we embed learning? We've all done it. We've gone to the conference. We've had a G up, listened to inspirational talks and thought, that's great, that's brilliant. And it confirmed kind of what we knew. And then a week later, and we just carry on. How do you embed it so it's there and you actually put it into practice day after day, week after week? And more importantly, how do you pass it on? That's your legacy. OK, so how do we go about this? Well, we've got a twin track approach, which I alluded to just before, which is basically um, this twin track approach of trying to develop the person alongside the technical and do that together. Okay. Um, what's going to happen in the next two talks, Georgina's going to talk about the technical side and Linda's going to talk about this side. Okay, mindset, it all starts with what's going on up here. So what we've done, we've done it for several years now, but we've really embedded this in the light of the pandemic. At interview, we make it crystal clear to people, even our advertisements, what we're about. This is what our organisation's aims and goals are. There's no point trying to recruit people who are not on the bus or who don't want to come on the bus. So make sure they, they get it. Ask them questions, you know? Um, if they're on the bus, that's the start, OK, because you can do something with that. Next one. Um, discussing and embedding openness to learning. Now, this to me is a core of our organisation. If we're open to learning, not only does it engender modesty, it allows change to happen. Um, it also allows us as individuals to grow and it allows the organisation to grow. The moment you think you know it, you stop developing. Um, if you can get that culture in place, and it's tough, I mean, I don't think this is an easy one to crack, but if you can get that sense of openness to learning. It allows us all to be able to talk in a very reasonable way to each other because we can all learn from each other every single day. It's also very motivating. It's liberating because you don't need to worry about having to know it. You know, archaeologists, I find there's a lot of fear in archaeology. Um, I used to be a lecturer as well. Um, and, you know, you see it at the student level, you see it at the professional level, and then you see it all the way through. We've got to get rid of that fear, you know. Um, none of us will know it all. And the great thing about archaeology is it is limitless. It's a sum of humanity. Owning your own development. Don't expect it to come to you. 
it's not going to be given to you. Um, so we encourage people to own their own development, uh, take control of it and push it. Um, and also, you can then help other people to do that too. Positive mental attitude. Um, awesome stuff. You know, get out of bed in the morning, think positively. Um, you know, anyone can be positive when the sun's shining. It's when it's raining and it's a tough day, then you've got to be positive. And that's also good leadership. And if you're positive, it rebounds, it ricochets because other people then feel positive, it comes back to you and you feel positive and on, and on the virtuous circle goes. There's a great book called The Happiness Advantage, recommend it. Communication. I must have looked at probably 2,000 CVs over my time, maybe more. I probably interviewed over 1,000 people. 95% say they're excellent communicators. Sorry, don't, don't, I do not believe it. I would say probably 5%. Um, everyone knows communication is important, and we all think we're good at it. But ask yourself, really, are you? And, you know, uh, communication comes in many forms. Um, the worst form, email, the dreaded email, it can be misinterpreted. Uh, think about the phone call. You can't see the body language. They might have had a smile on their face, but you can't see it. it but it's better than the email. But face to face, that's the place to do it. Point being is communication um, is not something to take for granted. It also requires understanding of other people who are different from you. Lindsay's going to talk about this in a minute. There's a great book that's come out just this last year called Surrounded by Idiots, and that's a book that goes with DISC. It's written by the same people. And the thesis is this. If you think you're surrounded by idiots, you're the idiot. Because what it is, is people who think differently from you, and that's okay. But you've got to understand where they're coming from. So communication is only as good as what you get back. Really important stuff, this. Fear again. This is all about fear. Don't worry about failure. Try not to fail. Rather, first attempt in learning. It's an opportunity. And then also, in terms of getting people's mindsets from the get-go, introduce the concept of above and below the line. And it looks like this. So, uh, above the line is being accountable, owning your situation. Yeah, that's my problem. Sorry I didn't do it. Leave it with me. I'll fix it. Brilliant stuff. It wasn't me. It was a dog. Oh, the bus was late. Uh, no, it didn't happen. No, it was like this. It was like that. This is negativity. This is a world of victimhood. This is the world of um, excuses, very negative mindsets. This will take you forward and it will take the team with you. Um, that mindset is so important. We talk about this all the time at work. No, don't, that's below the line. And it becomes fun as well. And it just reminds us all. It's like, no, sorry, got that wrong. Yep, my problem. I'll deal with it. Uh, sorry, that's gone back. Uh, yeah, so here's a point. When you're a baby, you fall down so many times until you can stand upright. That, a baby does it. Okay, how do we learn? Well, in many, many ways. Um, probably the one we're most accustomed to these days is by reading, obviously, but listening, watching YouTube. You know, you're going to tile your bathroom, watch YouTube. Um, you know, we can get a lot from that, and that's really useful. It gets better when we start discussing it, because this is what leads to co-creation, and that is shared learning. Role play, or directed guidance. So basically, this is how you actually do the job. So you mat it like this, you do this for GIS, whatever. Um, or role play it. Uh, better again, because you're simulating. Ultimately, that will lead to then independent learning, or as it used to be called, learning by doing. And this, the, these are the classic Pedagogy is how people learn. So you actually do the task, and you do it independently, and you make mistakes, and then you correct, and you, on you go. But you have to make mistakes. That's the thing. So don't beat yourself up. Don't beat other people up. Stay above the line. And then pass it on. The bit in between, though, um, is if you're going to pass it on, you've got to learn a little bit about how to teach. And that's why the title of the talk, To Teach is To Learn Twice, because that embeds your learning when you go through that process. OK, so uh, the competency staircase. I'm sure many of you have seen this before. But it starts off, uh, you come in new to a job or new to a role, because none of us are going to be at the top at the beginning in any role. Often it starts down here, unconscious incompetence. 
So you don't even know what you're doing wrong. And these are people who come into a job, they're happy, no problem, give it to me, I'll sort it. And they've no idea what's coming. <laughs> it's like brilliant. Um, and then it's suddenly, it's like, oh. And that point is a conscious incompetence. They suddenly realize what they don't know. Well, that's great, this is learning. Uh, so this is a good thing. So when you see people on this staircase, and it might be in their role per se, or it might be in a given task, you can break it down, you look at yourself, you know, look at all the different things you do, and you will see yourself, whether it's managing people, communication, all, all these different things that we all do, you will be somewhere on this staircase in each of those. Don't worry about it, just identify it. And once you've identified it, you can see where you need to go next. And ultimately, obviously you want to get to unconscious competence, so when you drive the car, you can change gear, you're not even thinking about it. Boom, you're not even thinking. When you're consciously competent, it means you've got to think about what you're doing still. So it's like, oh, I'm in third gear, I need to change up to fourth. Whatever it is. But you can break down your entire role. Um, you can also look at organisationally. How do you perform as an organisation in, in this way? So it's a useful way to think through and identify where you need to get the training and very specifically for what purpose. Okay, useful little diagram. I've just chucked this up. Um, we use this quite a bit because it's just handy. It's just a mnemonic, really. Again, you can do it by skill. You can do it by um, all sorts of things. Your role in the round, your organisation in the round. Attitude and ability. If you're in this quadrant, to be honest, <laughs> call it quits and just get out. Um, you're in the wrong role, you're in the wrong organisation because your attitude's not there and your ability's not there, so just get out. Um, if you're here, you might have a very positive attitude, but you're struggling on the skills. So we've got to get people into the competence zone. Often in this place is where coaching comes in, because attitude is very difficult to teach, but it's something you can coach. Skills is e more easily teachable, so that movement is a lot easier. That's a tough one. If you're in that place, that's often the hard place to get to. Um, yeah. Um, well, sorry. So, yeah. If you're sorry, it's the other way around. If your ability's there, it's getting the attitude shift. That's the that's the tricky one. Um, and I know Andrew's going to talk about coaching shortly, so I'll leave that one to her. Um, so, how to improve mindset, um, thought, word, deed, basically, and it's all interrelated. What you think affects your emotions, affects your behaviour. How you behave affects your emotions and thoughts. It's a feedback loop. Um, it's back to mindset. It starts there. So that's the importance of the positive mindset. OK, so yeah, just sort of nipping back then. Um, so we've looked at mindset, and then the next thing is a feedback. Um, how do we do it? Well, this is where we've ended up. Um, we have a line management system. Uh, we do appraisals with kind of 360 feedback, uh, so from peers, uh, which comes into this bit, ultra powerful. Um, feedback from trainers, um, if there's any external coach involved. Uh, what we do, all our guys in the management team, uh, they all have personal coaching as well. Um, and then we sort of do group stuff all the way down the organisation through that. The peer-to-peer -peer stuff, incredibly powerful, um, sharing experiences. And peer pressure is just amazing. Um, and if you can get this kind of thinking embedded, this becomes an extremely um, uh, useful way of motivating people as well. Um, and of course, you must have accountability built in. Um, it's not a free ride. So um, in terms of testimonials then, um, just to say, you know, we've done this, so we've kind of been through the mill with it as well uh, over several years. And I'll not go through what they say because they're self-evident. Um, but basically, wh what we found over the years is that um, people who are open to learning tend to do extremely well. Um, people who are closed and fearful, um, sometimes it can be quite a stiff reaction, a uh, real fear. Um, we try and encourage people and do everything we can, but ultimately, if someone does not want to do it and they're not open to learning, um, it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to change that. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, I'll come back to it again, that opens to learning is the key to unlocking everything. Uh, and it comes from the top. 
And if everybody can show that modesty from the top down, um, every single training course that our company does, I've been on. And it's not because I've got loads of time on my hands, I can assure you, because I really haven't. Um, it's because I'm going to experience it before I recommend it. Um, and some stuff I've done, and I've benefited massively, I've thought it was brilliant. And other stuff I've thought, you know what, that's not very good, we're not going to do that. But the point is I've been through it myself, and, um, and so has everyone else. So um, leading by example is important, and that helps to explode this kind of fear of openness to learning. Okay, so what we've done, we've got this twin track approach. Georgina's going to talk uh, next about this, our training academy, um, which is effectively broken down into five areas of competence. So I'll leave her to speak about that. And then the other pillar is the personal growth and development. And one, just one tool that we use as a starting point in that um, is the use of this uh, behavioral tendency tool, which is uh, called DISC. It's used all around the world. It is really useful. I'll not say any more about it. I'll leave Lindsay to do that. Um, but this isn't it. This is just our starting point that we use to basically get the conversation going. Um, so yeah, um, really just to finish off, all I'd say is um, archaeology is a people game. It's all about people. And if we don't invest in our people, we're failing basically. That's my view. And ultimately, if you want to embed learning and to get legacy so it continues, to teach is to learn twice. Thank you. <laughs>